hopefully soon you will be able to come to the library and check it out for yourself. The Night Gardener. Here we go, and I'm going to read just the first chapter, um, and it's not very long, but it's going to follow these two characters here, um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what they might look like. Storyteller at the Crossroads. The calendar said early March, but the smell in the air and said late October. A crisp sun shone over Cellar Hollow, melting the final bits of ice from the bare trees. Steam rose from the soil like a phantom, carrying with, with it the whisper of autumn smoke that had been lying dormant in the frosty underground. Squinting through the trees, you could just make out the winding path that ran from the village all the way to the woods to the south. People seldom traveled in that direction, but this on this March morning that felt like October, a horse and cart rattled down the road. It was a fish cart with a broken back wheel and no fish. Riding atop the bench were two children, a girl and a boy, both with striking red hair. The girl was named Molly, and the boy, her brother, was Kit. And they were riding to their death. This, at least, is what Molly had been told by no fewer than a dozen people as they traveled from farm to farm in search of Windsor Estate. Every person they spoke to said something ominous about sour woods and refused to tell them more. The Windsors, said one lanky shepherd whom Molly had stopped in the road. I'd just as soon lead my flock into a lion's den. He propped himself against his crook, eyeing Molly from heel to head to heel the way men sometimes did. Be that as it may, Molly said in her most polite voice, it's where we need to be. The Windsors were expecting us last week. Then they can wait a little longer. The man summoned up some phlegm from his throat and spat it on the ground. My advice, go back to whatever country you came from. The Sour Woods is no place for anyone. He shuffled across the road and into the trees, a trail of bleeding sheep behind him. Molly sighed. This was the third shepherd that hour. What do you think they all mean by Sour Woods? Kip asked when the flock had passed and they were moving again. Molly didn't know, and so she made something up. You didn't know about the sour woods, she said, pretending to be astonished. Why, it's a whole forest of nothing but lemon trees and lemon blossom and lemon moss and lemon weeds. They say when summer comes and the fruit is ripe, just breathing the air will make your whole face pucker. She said things like this to let her brother know she wasn't worried but she was worried. She and Kip had been riding almost nonstop for four days through rain and cold, led by a horse that barely tolerated them, due in part to the fact that Molly did not know the creature's name. She had told her brother it was Galileo, but the horse seemed to disagree. She had somehow imagined that English roads would be more broad and level, but these roads were even worse than those back home. The mud was black and greedy, holding on to whatever touched it, including their back wheel, which had lost three spokes only the day before. What little food there was had been in the back of the cart and had long since been eaten, and now only a few rancid, fishy odor remained. Are you cold? she asked, noticing her brother shiver under his coat. He shook his head, which he could see was damp. I'm hot. Molly's heart fell. Kip had been sick for weeks and showed little sign of getting better. He needed clean clothes. He needed a bed and a bath and a proper meal. He needed a home. Kip stifled a cough against his sleeve. Maybe all these folks is right, he said. Maybe we should just turn back to town. 
or go back home. Molly couldn't allow herself to wish for that. She and Kip were an ocean away from the place they called home. She put a hand on his forehead, which was warm. To hear you talk, a person think Ma and Da raised a pair of quitters. We'll have to, we'll find a place soon enough, directions or not. And there'll be hot food and a warm bed and honest work. They rode on, growing even more lost, until mid-afternoon when they came across someone unexpected. First, they heard a song, a sonorous drone that crept around the bend, slow and seductive. The music became louder as they approached and could soon make out a voice singing. It was an old mannequin woman, not much taller than Kip seated in the middle of a crossroads, singing to herself. The woman was clearly some sort of vagrant, for she carried upon her shoulders a huge pack bound with twine. The pack contained a clutter of random objects, hats, blankets, and lamps, as well as more interesting things like books, bird cages, and lightning rods. It reminded Molly of a snail shell. The woman was hunched over a strange instrument almost the size of her body. The instrument had a crank on one hand, and when she turned the handle, deep notes came out that Molly thought might be what it sound like if honeybees could sing. Molly slowed the cart and observed the woman from a safe distance. She was singing about an old man in a tree. Okay, that should remind you a little bit of the cover that has an old man in a tree. An old man and a tree. Her voice was surprisingly sweet. Molly had seen beggars playing instruments like this before in the market at home. A hurdy-gurdy, they called it. You think she's a witch? Kip whispered to his sister. Molly smiled. If that's a witch, she ain't much of one. Hardly a wart on her. Only one way to know for sure, though. She flicked the reins and the horse moved a little closer. Pardon me, Mum. she called out to the woman. My brother here would like to know if you're a witch or not. The woman continued playing, her fingers darting across along the keys. I fear my answer will disappoint, she said, not looking up. So you ain't a witch then, Kip called, apparently wanting to be completely clear on this point. The woman set her instrument down and peered at him, eyebrows raised. Not everything old and ugly is wicked. I dare say that with enough years, your lovely sister will look no better than I do, and it will be her that's frightening children to come by. She punctuated this with a suspiciously witch-like crackle. The woman struggled to her feet, which seemed difficult to task with so heavy a pack, and offered a neat curtsy. The name's Hester Kettle. I'm the storyteller in these parts. I travel here and about, trading my songs for lodging and food and odd things. She wiggled a shoulder, jangling the forks and wind chimes that hung from her pack. Molly hadn't known there was such a job as a storyteller, but it sounded like fine work. Telling stories was one of the things she herself did best. She had told stories to sneak her brother out of the orphanage. She had told stories to get a horse, and if she encountered any questions at her new job, she would tell stories once more. Still, there was something about this woman that made her uneasy. And pray, Mum, Molly said, what's a storyteller doing all the way out here, on foot, no less? The woman shrugged, sucking something from her teeth. I'm on foot because I've got no horse. As to why I'm here, new stories are rare in these parts. It's not every morning we get strangers coming through the hollow. And two foreign children with a nasty, sorry, with a nest with nary a parent between them, riding due south on a stolen fish cart. She clucked her tongue. Why, that's a story if ever I heard one. Molly caught her breath. It took everything in her not to look at her brother. And... Who says the cart was stolen? The woman grinned at her. The look on your face says it twice over, dearie. You take it that back, Kip said, surprising Molly. We're not thieves. 
my sister bought this cart from a fisherman who had no use for it. He was joining the Navy to fight giant squids. He beamed at his sister. Ain't that right, Molly? Molly nodded vaguely, more or less. She stared at the woman, silently pleading with her to drop the subject. The old woman whistled. Giant squids, you say? Seems the truth is more compelling than the lie. She nodded to Molly. I apologize for accusing you, she added. For picking such a fine name, and let me congratulate you, she added. For picking such a fine name for your vessel, she winked. I have a feeling it suits you. The woman was talking about the letters painted on their wagon. The side had once read St. John's Cod Shop in gold script, but the paint had mostly worn off, so only the letters S, C, O, and P remained. It's just a random jumble, Molly said. She didn't like this conversation. Something about the way the woman looked at her, looked into her, made her wary. If you don't mind, Mum, my brother and me are expected somewhere this morning. The woman stepped near, blocking their path. You're headed to the Windsor home, is that right? Molly tried not to look startled. Do you know him? She said. Not really. I did meet Master Windsor once when he was no older than you. That was near thirty years back, right before they shipped him off to live with relatives in the city, poor thing. The old woman shook her head. When he moved back here last autumn, family in tow, well, let's just say it surprised a few folks. Molly didn't think there was anything strange in returning to a place where one grew up. Only a few weeks here, and she would give anything to go back home to County Dongle, famine or not. We're a little turned around at the moment, Molly said. We asked some farmers what roads to take, but they were a bit shy with the answer. Hester Kettle nodded looking into the forest behind her. Folks here think that they're doing you a good turn by not telling you the way. None of them wants to be the one who steered two innocent babes into the sour woods, foreigners though you may be. And what's so bad about the sour woods? Molly asked. Why, everyone in Cellar Hollow knows to keep clear of the place. Children are warned off by their parents, who were warned off by their own parents, and so on as far back as any soul can remember. So you don't know, Molly said. First-hand accounts are rare, but most folks claim to know someone who knows someone fool enough to venture across the river into those woods. The woman hesitated for a long moment, her fingers playing at the edge of her patchwork cloak. They say the sour woods changes folks, brings out something horrible in them. And then there's the other thing, tragic, really. Kipling Ford, w what other thing, he asked. Molly clenched her jaw. The last thing she needed was for this old loon filling her brother's head with frightening nonsense. She caught Hester's eye. The old woman seemed to weigh Molly's glare and then smile at Kip. Just rumor and hokum, love. Why, half of it's stories I made up just to earn a meal. You'll be fine. Molly nodded a silent thank you. Whatever rumors about this place were, it didn't matter. The job was their only chance to be safe and together. Who else would take in two Irish children with no guardians or references? Besides, if it was so bad, why would Master Windsor have moved his family there? So, you'd be willing to point us the way then, Molly asked. Hester rubbed her chin as if thinking it over. I would, but I might ask a small favor in return. We've got no money, Molly said. Hester waved her off. Nothing so large as that, dearie. I only ask that you come around and tell me a story or two about what you find there. Ever since the Windsors moved back, the hollow's been all abuzz with curiosity. A woman of my trade could eat for a month on that information. That I can do. Molly said. The old woman stepped aside and pointed down the path to the left. Ain't three miles as a crow flies. Follow the sound of the river, and if you hit a fork, take the way that looks overgrown. Sourwoods is the road less traveled by far. When you come to an old bridge, well, you're right on top of it. 
Molly still wasn't sure whether the old woman was being completely honest, but she decided that some directions were better than none. She thanked Hester Kettle, snapped the reins, and rode past her onto the rougher path. She and her brother descended into a gorge, and behind them she could hear the woman resume her singing. The haunting melody carried through the air, growing more and more faint. Molly wondered about what might be awaiting her and her brother as the house in the sour woods, and what sort of story she might bring back for the strange old woman. She wished silently that it would be a happy 